this presentation has evolved from a lot of years in security, mostly from the, uh, the infrastructure side and the development side. Not a lot when it comes to audit. So if any of your auditors, feel free to let me know when I miss something. So, first let me introduce myself. This is me. So you can see I've been doing this for a while. This is what I do. Now, more seriously, I have been at this for a while. I've been doing this long enough to see security projects fail over and over again. And I've developed this method, not really methodology, a series of concepts is more likely, to explain why things fail and how we might want to start doing things a little bit differently. This is a security practice that's drawing on ideas from other fields, from psychology, from economics, but mostly from agile development and lean manufacturing. You may have heard of Rugged DevOps. We had a Gene Kemp here giving a, a wonderful talk. Um, a lot of people work on the same thing, like all at once, so it suddenly hits the zeitgeist and pops up. This is a similar concept of DevOps, except it's coming from small, medium business. DevOps is really coming from entrepreneurial mega spaces on down. <coughs> So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about uh, patterns, technology, people, and process, complexity, and uh, how that works with scale and repeated tasks. We're going to talk about the situation we're in with regard to competition and attackers. We're going to talk about profitability. We're going to talk about aspects of lean security and solutions that work. If you want to make snarky comments, please use lean security hashtags so I can look for later on. <laughs> okay. This is a very theoretical talk, and because it's theoretical, I start with foundations, and I kind of build on the foundations, which means everybody that comes in about five minutes from now is going to be totally lost. So I'm glad you're here, but feel free to ask questions. There's only so much you can really cram into an hour-long talk. And each one of these points could probably be an hour long talk, hour long talk in of itself. So feel free to ask. I know we're all technical people, we tend to be somewhat introverted. Break through that and ask questions. So, core concepts. The first is the learning cycle. As people, we learn best by making mistakes. You know, everybody here, is, I'm sure, has heard that making mistakes is the best way to learn. Now, what that means is, because people hate making mistakes, we wind up putting ourselves in situations where we make fewer and fewer mistakes, which means as time goes by, we learn less and less. And that's one of the problems we face. This is one of the reasons why security operations tends to weaken over time. Okay? Because we tend to stop improving things, because we tend to stop learning, because learning hurts. So, one of the key things is to build learning cycles into your operation, learn from them, and then start to tune the cycles instead of simply tuning technology. Another point is complexity and scale. This is your basic bell curve. Has everybody here taken stats, understand the basics of the Gaussian curve, all of that? Anybody completely lost at this point? All right. Very, very basic overview. Anything under the curve is possible. People tend to focus on the center of the curve. They focus on things that tend to be most likely to work. So if you look at a solution set, you have a set of solutions, some of which are likely to work, some of which are not likely to work, and we tend to look right in the middle at the ones that are most likely to work. But when we do this, we ignore what's on the sides. These are not solutions that are likely to work or these are solutions that are often not likely to work easily. So when you focus on the center, on the most probable things that are going to work, you're cutting out the things that uh, may actually work better in the long term. Basically constraining the hard at the cost of the easy. So, now, this is where things start to get interesting. Because organizations are growing more and more complex. And it's not happening in a uniform way. So if I'm looking at solutions, like you know, have a standard business problem, 
and you need to find a database. So you're, you're looking at the different databases that are out there. Um, you can have very complex databases. You can have very simple databases. Most people, as I was just talking with Ron, focus in the middle, SQL Server. Okay, it's less expensive, but it's not completely free. It's a little less complex than some of your bigger ones, but it's more complex than others. You know, they pick the middle because people tend to pick the middle. Now, when you get a group, you tend to get clumped. And this is what's happening in our industry. We have this group of systems that we've built, a group of businesses, groups of organizations. And we've looked at the organizations and said, what do we need to do to protect these organizations? And we've come up with a set of solutions that generally works, and we call it best practice. However, as you start to understand any complex system, you start to see subgroups. You start to see that the big system is made up of smaller systems. And this actually goes remarkably deep and fine. If you're looking at physics and uh, you look at you know, the old double slit experiment, if anybody else has a physics degree in here? Anybody? Anybody? All right. When you get multiple slits in a slit experiment, you start to see these same patterns appear over and over again, built out of other patterns like this. It just, it gets down into the finding of the grid. So what does this mean to you? What this means is that if you have the massive curve of all organizations in the world, they're gonna break down into highly complex organizations, such as your Amazon.coms, your Microsofts, principal financial group, you know, your really, really large fortune fund you're going to get the small ones. Your mom and pop shops, ice cream store, neighborhood farm. Now what's interesting is these particular patterns appear elsewhere. In physics, you have relativity. In economics, you have macroeconomics. You have highly complex patterns appearing in the fields of linguistics, in the fields of mythology, in the fields of literature. And you have simple things. You have quantum mechanics, you have microeconomics, and you have other patterns that appear here. And the important piece here is the two groups have completely different base rules. If you're working in a large company, you have macroeconomics and relativistic sort of rule sets that apply that simply do not apply in your small businesses. And what this means is that as time goes by and the systems start to separate, you wind up where the best practice that had been defined for the entire group very, applies very little to the two groups on the side. This is the problem we're in. We've gotten to failure because we've been inv investing in best practice all of this time. As best practice has increasingly narrowed on this is what you must do to be successful, and has cut off the other sets of solutions in the space, then you are in a situation where organizations following best practice get stuck. They can't move forward. They can't pull in other ideas, whether it's new vendors, or new um, development concepts, or you know, open source. It's not possible because it doesn't fit their concept of best practice, and their concept of best practice is no longer protecting them because it no longer applies to their particular use case. Because this is where people like to focus. Okay. Another point is time cycles. As time goes by, resources change. You see resources have and flow. These can be profits, this can be the amount of work that needs to be done, this can be the time available to do the work. And you see organization structure around this. You know, we've seen it on a yearly scale where retail focuses on Christmas time. You know, they ramp up all of their people around Christmas time so they can pull all the resources out. We see the same cycle shifted by five months in the CPA world. We see it on the daily cycle in manufacturing where you have people ramping up for first shift. You know, third shift is always longer. These cycles appear over and over again 
throughout every type of business. Now, as time goes by, the goal is to gain resources. So you're really looking, um, sorry, about that. Um, you compare to other organizations. So with other organizations, you, I mean, how many people here feel like you're always behind the competition? Anybody? <coughs> what often happens, the competition is putting out press releases, and you hear about when they do things well, but you never hear about when they do things well. They face these sort of cycles the same way you do. And what often feels like, you know, we're lagging behind, we're always lagging behind, is a phase shift. You know, you're actually on a similar cycle, it's just, you're doing poorly when they're doing well and that feels bad, and when you're doing well, you're too busy doing well to notice how everybody else is doing. Okay. The goal is to, oops, is to improve and manage over time. So you don't burn through all your resources every cycle. You can serve a few, you use it to grow, you use that to grow, and you use that to grow. And then, as you cycle faster, you do better, it starts looking more linear. And this is really what people like. You know, this is what you know, Wall Street likes, is to see constantly growing growth, right? Security's goal is to protect this, okay? We get in the habit of checking ticky boxes. We get in the habit of telling people no, 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 because they're not following best practice. The goal is to make sure the business's resources are used appropriately to meet business goals. That's really it. You know, we need to find these drops and make sure the drops happen as minimally as possible and that we can recover as quickly as possible. The attacker's goal, in contrast, is to win. The attacker needs only one, and they can launch tons of attacks. The economics are heavily in their favor. You know, an attacker can, uh, you know, faces very little capital investment in an attack and the internet grants them anonymity. So they simply launch tons and tons of attacks, and whoever they get, they get. So we're facing this deluge of incoming attacks, as well as a few custom targeted attacks on particular types of businesses. Particularly if you're in a growth <coughs> industry. If, if you want to know if you're in a growth industry, look at uh, China releases a five-year plan every five years, and they actually list these are the industries we want to grow. Interestingly, those are the industries we see attacks in the most. No idea why that happens. <laughs> the economics are such that the attackers are going to keep attacking. They're going to continuously improve until they get somebody. They're strongly incentivized to win this game. And because of that, if you're not defending yourself in a similar way, you're pretty much going to lose. The economics are going to guarantee it. Security is not just about attacks. Security is about economic advantage. And that's why we have to look at security against both the attackers and against our competition. Basically, if you protect yourself, the attackers are going to be driven towards your competition. And that's the fundamental key here. You can't look at yourself as an isolated unit anymore. You're part of an ecosystem, and you have to function as part of an ecosystem to deflect the attacks somewhere, not only where they won't hurt you, but where they will benefit you. Okay, that's the end of the foundations part. I'm going to get slightly more practical next. Any questions thus far? Room full of introverts, no questions at all. All right. Who here has heard of the Perry Toe Principle? More than usual. You talk to business people, they don't know it by this name. <laughs> they also, you ask them about the principle of factor scarcity? No. Nobody ever hears about that. Business prefer 80 20. And uh, if anybody has actually studied Pareto, you understand 80 20 doesn't actually mean 80 20 in most places. But it is used a lot. In IT, there are certain um, you, know, you see this a lot when it comes to projects. What this basically means is you start with a budget. When you burn through 20% of the budget, the project's 80% done, 
and it then takes the rest of that budget to finish the project. Okay? Everybody's run across this at some point, basic project management stuff, right? This fails hard when it comes to security. And that's because you can never get security to 100%. So what happens is instead of getting this 100% wall, you wind up blowing through your budget to get an 80% wall. That takes the rest of the budget to just get a little bit more because there's a gap. There's always a security gap because security can never be 100%. Security can get to 100% in any one vector. That's a business unit you don't need because you've blocked your customers off. So this gap is always going to exist. Attempts to reduce it are going to fail. Attempts to shrink it are going to result in waste. There's this economic inflection point at which point it no longer makes sense to throw money at this problem. You accept the problem where it is, and you move on from there. The attackers do not have security gaps. This is one of the fundamental differences between an ongoing attack cycle and an ongoing defense cycle. Because people tend to avoid these learning situations and security tends to weaken over time, the gap tends to widen. The magic trick in having an ongoing protective security defensive operation is to find the point at which point it no longer makes economic sense to throw money at it and keep an eye on it. Because the gap's going to widen, you need to throw enough money at it to keep it at a reasonable level and then move on somewhere else. Which is where, oh, right, my data. Basically, security is ever changing and it's impossible to perfect. It's not a race. It's a constant marathon with no rest. And that's where lean security comes in. So the next six points are different aspects of lean security. If you're familiar with natural development, there are going to be some things that are familiar, some things that might not be hopefully at all. The, security, the lean security version of the 8020 rule is the 80 by 5 rule. Now, when I was just getting started, I, sorry, wrong story. Anybody here run Linux? Anybody here run Linux on servers? Okay. Who, how many people are looking at your SSH logs? <laughs> how, many, how many hits you get? A lot till I block brute forces. Okay. How do you block brute forces? Uh, firewall rule to detect uh, to do uh, 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 rate limiting and then kill people when they get too high. Okay. Doing anything else? Okay. Anybody else in that situation? Okay. Yeah, Are you doing anything else? Yeah, I, I uh, don't allow password authentication. You okay. can't All right. That's good. Anybody else? Yes. Just block only from certain, only allow from certain IP addresses. Block everybody else. Okay. If you're in a situation where that works, that, that's great. You can also use a different port. Yep. You can do port not. Yep. All of these are in, in my list, actually. Let's see. Did you miss anything? Maybe. I have rooting the port, disabling admin. Nobody mentioned disabling admin. I assume you're disallowing root access. Okay. Okay. Uh, block your failed logins, requiring keys, and using a VPN or port company. Yeah, anything else? But the specific business have you only, we have firewall rule only to allow it from the IP address that the customer gave us. So it doesn't matter where else you are, you're not getting it. Looks great to the customers with IPv6. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good approach. Now what's interesting here is nobody here has mentioned that they're using all of these techniques. Right? We're just using a handful. Now, if you took the budget and you spent it on getting 80% security twice and then burned it to get some more layers. You wind up with you know, blocking and report as an example, you know, doing you know, root deny, doing the other stuff we talked about at each point. And an attacker who tries to do this is going to find out you know, climbing five walls is a lot harder than climbing one. Right? They're going to wind up going somewhere else. 
hopefully, towards your competition. If you're in a foreign targeted group, they're guaranteed to go after your competition because the people attacking you are from the Russian Business Network and from China and a few others. And they're targeting specific industries. So that's a win. You're in a target industry, you have good defense, that's great. You're sending them somewhere else. Now, the important thing here is this isn't just layers. Layers is just about defense. If you want to have an agile response, you have to look at what's getting through the layers. Because if you've changed your default port and somebody is getting through, there's still stuff in the log, that means those people looking at that port you've moved it to are looking at you. They're not just looking for an open port 22 somewhere. Now, if you've disabled your login, and somebody logs in as root from somewhere, they're really going after you, and you probably need to step up your game. Okay? The space between the walls is just as important as the walls themselves. And if you're not looking at people getting through your different layers and figuring out what that means and building that into your response system, you're failing the game. Takeaway here, a series of perfect protections better than one really good one. So, we talked about the competition, tending to be further and further behind. We have a tendency to overestimate our competition's capabilities and underestimate our own. Operations is hard because it's asymmetric. It's very hard to defend constantly. It's very easy to attack. This, okay, who here is a penetration tester? Okay, you guys have the easiest job in the industry. Hands down, I have no idea why everybody says it's so great. Attack is easy. Anybody can attack, especially if you're not a penetration tester and you're an actual black hat, because you can write scripts and you can have them run forever. Pen testers, you're narrowed by you know, scope, you know, your engagement is limited, the attack tools you're allowed to do is limited. The attackers, blue sky scenario, they can do whatever they want for as long as they want, and they're going to get in. <laughs> it means we have to change what operations means, because the way we're doing it, we're losing. Failure is hard to accept, but it's the best way to learn. This is cutting in and out because it sounds like it's cutting in and out. Okay, all right. In the entrepreneurial world, there's this phrase called fail fast, the idea being the faster you fail, the less of your startup capital you've burned. Okay? And that means you have more capital left, you can try again. Now in security, if you fail fast, all of your data is in somebody else's hands, and you're done. So we need to do something a little bit different. And basically, fail small, and then we need to learn fast from it. We need to limit damage where possible. So that's what this cycle is about. Detect analyze, and prevent. Okay? This is your standard response cycle. You find an attack, you figure out how it happened, and you find a way to prevent it. Now, this is based on real attacks. You know, in order for this to work effectively, the real attack has to be successful. And that means you've been compromised. So a lot of business owners don't like taking this approach. They prefer this one which is predict, prevent, measure. Okay, this is based on a proactive concept. So you look at what might happen, and you wind up investing there, and then you look for what, you know, are attacks coming in? I mean, who, who here's old enough to remember when firewalls first hit the market? Anybody? Okay, how many reports did you send out showing management how many attacks those things blocked? Is that a useful metric today? When you just have a PPM learning cycle, you wind up with a lot of waste because you're throwing up defenses against things you might, you think might happen. There's no guarantee it's going to happen. You know, you're kind of focusing on measure, and you're really hoping that your measurements are going to be right. But a lot of people aren't even doing the measure piece. So to be successful, you have to combine them both. We actually have. 
hypothesis, experiment, and review. It took us hundreds of years, but we finally managed to read about the scientific method. <laughs> Basically, if you're not changing, you're not adapting. Suppose your competition is averaging, let's say, one cycle a month, and an attacker is learning twice as fast. This means your competition is accepting this much risk over time, and it's just going to grow. If you don't want that to be you, you have to learn a little bit faster than the attacker. That places your competition in a point where they're constantly losing out and you're constantly gaining advantage over them, not just because you're learning, but also because you're reflecting the attacks down and down. You have to maximize your resources. This means identifying these learning cycles and finding ways to move through them more quickly and more easily. Now, does anybody know who Joy Ito is? They need anything to anybody? He's the director of the MIT Media Lab. He recently did a fascinating study on smaller, smaller sized businesses, smaller sized networks. And what he found out is the cost of assessing risk is often greater than the cost of failure. Who here is an internal assessment? Anybody? A few people? Okay. You're probably safe because you work for a big business. A lot of people in internal assessment are starting to lose their jobs. And it's just going to increase. Because it is easier to simply say, eh, we'll deal with it when it comes, than to build defenses. Now, things tend to move in cycles, you know, in pendulums, if you think of it this way. Odds are we're swinging a little bit too far back on one side of the pendulum. But you know, you have to look. You know, you look at the market. And you look at what happen, what's happened stock-wise. You know, Sony got breached 37 times in, what was it, four months last summer? They're still here as a company. You know, people are still buying Sony equipment. Um, Yahoo just was in the news, I guess, last week. Yahoo's still there. People still using Yahoo. So you have to really think about how... What? Yeah, but that was not really agent. Yeah, a good security lesson is don't lie on your resume. That one has negative ramifications. But breaches, it's starting to look like don't. You know? Or if they do, they're oddly scoped. You know, a breach could have negative ramifications for a class of customers. It could have negative ramifications for certain people with certain types of jobs. But it's a lot harder to make the business case to walk up to a CEO and say, if you're a breach, you're going to go out of business because we have hundreds of examples of companies that haven't. Yeah. Well, that applies to the B2Cs. In the B2B market, we see companies failing in the future, so. Well, I'm not saying it's universal truth. Right, but, but do, you, yeah. do you see that being, what the, you know, it's a different market between like a business to consumer market and a business to business market? Yes and no. So, okay. sorry, could you share what, what particular companies? So, yeah, companies like Heartland that, went out uh, when, you know, TJ Maxx was fine when they had the credit card breaches. They right. heard for a while that Heartland and a few other credit card processing companies went under after their breaches. Is Heartland actually under? No. Oh, they, they, they were 20% they were down. Oh, they, okay. they, they've been 20% down. I'm getting the wrong one then. Right. There, there, was, there was one, and I always forget yeah. the name, and, oh. and they, were, they, were, they were doing everything wrong yeah. for a PCI. They were breaking all of the rules. Mm -hmm. oh, first so, data. First data, thank you. Yeah. First data was the only one that Visa shut down. And they actually, so I personally argue they got shut down because of contractual violations that were revealed by that breach. Right, and I think that's part of where it comes from is because consumers don't have contractual, like enforceable contractual to the business. Sure, I guess, yeah. I guess, I guess I would just, you know, I, I, I tend to agree that, that I haven't seen a, a breach right. actually cause a company to go on. I, I know of one example. Yeah. And that's, did you know Tom? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a good um, example. Well, well it's, it's kind of a good example. It's kind of not. You know, it only got shut down because its biggest customer was, what was the government of Iceland? You know, it, or Norway, I forget which country it was, but it, it was a subset. The Netherlands. Netherlands. Holland. Yeah. Holland? Yeah. Netherlands. Netherlands, thank you. 
For those going on the internet, so look at the camera and just say, you know, all European countries are the same. <laughs> Go ahead, send the email. Um, we already here. <laughs> so, I understand what you're saying. I don't necessarily think it's a business to business versus business to consumer issue. I think it's a awareness of the customer issue. Right. And, you know, there have been businesses I've left because of. And the question is, what sorts of businesses have the customers so clued into security that they care? Right. And yeah, that, that's someone who's going to vary business to business. Well, the, the other thing is customers have a tendency to look at, you know, if you're addressing your security issues and you resolve, they feel you resolve, then they're likely to come back to it. That's certainly true. And, you know, there are some companies I've joined after a breach because three months after a breach, their security is through the roof. It's better than it's ever been. So, something to think about. Okay. Now, I'm gonna get, get a little bit into psychology here. There are two interesting brain measurements that have come up. Does, does anybody here have a psychology degree? Anybody read the cycle, the psych journals? Yeah, I just call those psych journals. They're kind of fun. Okay. When you give very, very smart people the ability to shove metal into people's brains and measure what goes on, interesting things happen. And one of these is they've actually been able to measure the electronic signal that happens when people make mistakes. And it's called error-related negativity. And basically they're measuring how bad you feel when you screw up. There's another one called error-related positivity, which is measuring how you feel, you know, kind of how you learn from the process. And positivity always lacks negativity, sometimes by a few seconds, sometimes by several minutes. But it's this pattern people will see. And what's fascinating is people that are incredibly smart have a much higher negativity rating than positivity. And positivity is linked to having a growth mindset and improvement and hard work. So what does this mean? This means statistically, if you take a group of people, you have a bunch of really smart people and a bunch of hard workers, the hard workers are going to do a better job of securing their systems than the smart people. Because the smart people feel really bad when they make mistakes and they actively avoid learning situations. Hard workers work through. So if you're in a position of hiring, you, know, you need a few smart people to get the ideas. But you need hard workers to actually get things done. If you're a really smart person, and you know, pretty much the only thing you can do is recognize that because you're really smart, by the time you hit a certain point in your life, usually late 20s, you're going to be actively avoiding learning situations. You need to work against that tendency. This is why a lot of really smart people tend to get stuck. You know, they get stuck professionally. They get stuck you know, emotionally. You see this happen again and again and again. People hit this certain point, and they never move beyond it. And it's because of these sorts of things. Now, when I was starting my career, I was responsible for building a Linux appliance. This would have been back in the late 90s. And these Linux appliances, I didn't know what I was doing, because nobody knew what they were doing back at this time. You know, there were only a handful of people that understood Linux, and the rest of us were getting Red Hat books from Porter's or Barnes and & Noble and trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. Well, it was faster than actually downloading the, the CD. The CD comes in a book. So I was building these things, and I figured out how to you know, make my own disks, and, kind of make my own install script and, and fork these things out. And eventually, after a couple of years, I was managing this distributed global network of about 50 of these suckers. And one day, I walk in, and one of them is not behaving right. And as I dig into it, it turns out it's been compromised. Somebody got in, there was an SSH vulnerability, and they'd gotten into it. And then, over the next hour, while I was troubleshooting that, five more of them popped. Now what happened here 
is the attackers were looking for a flaw. And once they found the flaw, they found a way to use the search engines at the time, probably Optimista, to figure out how to find other systems like this. And then target those and pop them all in use. The problem happened because SSH wasn't patched. SSH wasn't patched because SSL wasn't patched. SSL wasn't patched because GLOC wasn't patched. GLOC wasn't patched because that would have required a reboot. And in this particular environment, the boss said, stop bugging our customers with reboots. This was a learning cycle that had grown complex. And it had grown complex to the point where it stalled out. I didn't know how to solve these problems because I was young. I didn't know what was going on. You know, nobody I knew knew what was going on. We were just kind of figuring these things out and screwing up as we went along. And that's what can happen when you fail to learn. And when the learning cycle breaks, things just stop getting done, operations halts, and the amount of time after that, bad things happen. So, if you're not learning and adjusting, you're losing. But change brings problems with it. So, to fix this, you need to identify why you're making changes. Okay. Anybody here doing test-driven development? Really? In this group? Nobody's doing test-driven development. Not a single person. Wow. Okay. Because the next question is who's doing test-driven change management? And I don't know very many people who do that at all. The problem here is, if you're going to make a change, you know why you're making a change. That applies to code, that applies to system changes, that applies to life. If you don't know why you're making a change, you don't know when you're done making the change. You don't know if the change is going to work. You, know, you have no <coughs> idea what's going on. You're just out there pushing stuff around, throwing dice until you get five sixes. Basically, you need to approach changes as if they're experiments. You need to figure out why you're doing something so you can test for it and figure out when you're done. Now, it's tempting when you're doing this to add changes together and make a big change pile. Anybody here do change piles? We call them maintenance windows. Okay. When you do a change pile and something goes wrong, you don't always know what caused because you've made too many changes at once. Okay. This results in uncertainty, which results in lost time, which results in the time savings you think you're going to get by adding all these changes together being a false economy. It's better to resist small change, to resist big changes, and go for small changes and leap from one to another based on the results of the tests you're running. This is simpler, this is faster, and this massively reduces the waste in your environment. So you wind up learning faster, and you can innovate faster. Basically, small changes is big learning. Now, security software tends to be complex. Often, it gets more complex than an organization can support. A simpler environment results in easier troubleshooting and faster learning. Anybody here running a SIM? Okay. Anybody here using the SIM? Yeah. SIM is a good example here because you, they tend to get very complex. When people buy it and say, we're going to ship all the logs to this box. It's going to magically tell us when the problems happen. And what usually happens is you get the firewalls pointing there. You maybe get some switches pointing there. You get a few key servers pointing there. And then it kind of stalls out because it gets really complex. <coughs> and you can't use the sim if you don't understand your environment. If your environment is too complex, you're not going to understand the environment. So you wind up taking this $100,000 you spent on a sim solution, and it sits in the data center, blinking lights to make people happy. It doesn't actually give you the actionable results you want. It's not to say that sims are bad. But a lot of people buy technology before they have the understanding because they haven't invested in the learning cycles. You learn it first, 
before you can use the technology. Yes. So, so for us poor people that don't have hundred thousand dollars, can you explain what a SIM is? Um, security event information management. Only sixty. Only sixty thousand. All right, it's come down. Is it like an appliance and um, It can be an appliance. It can be software. Uh, it can be a virtual appliance. Uh, generally, it's it's what has evolved out of log management systems. So it's, it's a series of rule sets that try to, to trigger alarms or right. you know, something like yeah. that. Yeah, it's it's log management with business intelligence wrapped around it. Yeah. And if you don't have a hundred thousand dollars, you can get a you know you can download Security Onion, which is a free sim like thing based on Linux and Snort and stuff like that. And I actually advocate people use that. Because if they're going to stall out after doing, you know, just a couple of servers and their firewalls, I'd rather they do it on that than on a massive system. Okay, metrics. A little bit of story here. About, I guess, two years ago now, I consulted for a company that had had a recent hire quit, and the recent, you know, when a recent hire quits and goes to a competitor. The first thing you do is you pull out their little non-compete that they sign so you can sue them, right? Or at least get some money from the competitor. And uh, when they did this, they found out that it wasn't signed. It was in with all the other paperwork, but it had never been signed. And that set off a little bit of an alarm bell. And they had me come in and, and kind of take a look at what, what was going on. And what I got when I got his laptop was a completely pristine system. It was beautiful, it ran great, but there was no data on it. So I started running some forensic tools and digging a little bit deeper. And I found evidence of files he looked at, evidence of files that had been copied, not to the local drive, but to a USB drive, Drive E, that had been plugged into the system. Drive E was not provided. Moreover, in the history files, listed where these files were coming from. They were mostly coming from two different places, the CRM and the shared network drive. Basically, the only logical conclusion was that he had been hired by the competitor to join this company and then go to the competition with all of the sensitive internal data. Now it doesn't matter to the point, but I also don't see why it would make more sense. I mean, why would you? Harder. It's a lot. Well, it's also a lot harder to find two ethical people. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky for us. Um, now, this gets into metrics. You know, these are what could be considered firing metrics, because if you're looking at somebody's laptop before they leave, there are things you can look for to make sure they haven't erased their tracks, and this hadn't been done. Now. You can't talk about metrics without talking about these standard metrics. Anybody have a CSSP? Anybody recognize these metrics? Anybody hate these metrics? Okay. Since change must be measured to be successful, and learning comes from experiments, and experiments are nothing but changes you're paying attention to, you have to consider this. These are calculation-based metrics. Calculation-based metrics are inherently flawed because they're based on uncertainty. And if you have uncertainty, you're going to base your strategy on bad numbers. More importantly, uncertainty causes debate. If you're in a situation and you're talking about ROI. Okay, let's actually ask. Who here has discussed ROI in a business environment? Of those people, who's debated how much money was actually saved by the ROI project? Who here has ever actually used ROI and not had it debated? Anybody? This is the problem. If metrics can be debated, they will be debated. Every single time. Because the alternative to arguing over how you're measuring things, whether the measurement is right, 
is actually doing work, and who wants to do that? So you need to think about the metrics you're using. You need to focus on things that are less disputable. Look at the dollars that are spent on technology and operations, but go on to the places. You know, look at the time you spend analyzing incidents in between incidents. And if you evolve to the point where you're actually measuring learning cycles, look how fast you're going through the learning cycles. In the Agile world, this can be time between stand-ups, can be time between retrospectives, stuff like that. Basically, everybody has to understand and agree to what you're doing before you do it, or it's not going to be successful. And what's nice is, just like you go through learning cycles, you can go through metric tuning cycles. This is your basic metric tuning cycle. First thing to ask is, does it make sense? Can you stand up in front of your board or your management and talk about what you're measuring and have them go, yes, I understand? Isn't it useful? Does it match to business level needs? You know, if you're selling widgets, does it link to how many widgets you're selling in a certain period of time? If you're doing customer service, is it about quality? And finally, can it be improved? Are you getting the data fast enough? Are you getting it too fast that you can't actually work with it? Is it accurate enough? Are you getting too much data? You know, what can you do to make it better? Now, from a practicality perspective, organizations are made up of groups. And yes, it's this chart again. So we were rolling your eyes when it came out the first time around. Hopefully it'll work better now. An organization made up of groups. Example is security and management. For some reason, these two groups don't tend to get along. And they have to agree in order to move forward. You would think they focus here on the overlap of solutions that would work for both groups. But they don't. Because each group has a tendency to look at their own solutions. They're going to argue back and forth about solutions that don't apply in either case. They're going to waste time, they're going to waste money trying to figure this out. Work's not going to get done. You have to work to agreement on metrics before you can do anything else. Lord Kelvin, back when we found the scientific method the first time, <coughs> said if you cannot measure it, you can't improve it. And that's still true today. Nothing's perfect, so start somewhere, measure, and adjust. A good example here are policies. Who here has policies? Security policies, anybody? Okay, a few people. How many are measuring how many people are actually reading policies? Is it in front of the answers? Okay, that's good. At least you know. A very simple solution here is to put policies into a document management solution, something that you can then pull metrics out of. Because then when you make a policy change and HR sends the email out, you can tell these are the people that opened this file. You can also get more interesting data. You can look at a breach, and you can say, who read the policy that would have prevented this breach before the breach happened? And who read it afterwards? You know, this can be very useful information, but I don't know a single company that does it. As another tip, if you're still using the same metrics today that you were a year ago, you're probably losing the fight because you're not evolving rapidly. The metrics you're using have to change over time. Okay. A couple of years ago, I was working with a large nonprofit. They called me up because uh, a series of incidents happened in a very short period of time. Basically, the CFO system had gotten infected with malware. The malware phoned home with banking credentials, and overnight, $600,000 vanished from check. Now, the company did not tell me, or organization, did not tell me why they had $600,000 sitting in check. That would concern me. But it was gone. And the bank couldn't protect against this because it came through a legitimate channel. 
This particular client had no anti-malware, had no web filter. The CFO had local admin rights. The CFO had a laptop that the person could take home. The bank had protections, but the client turned them off because they were getting in the way. And uh, it was just gone. Now, they'd gone through an assessment, and this had uncovered issues, but they chose not to deal with the issues because they thought it was too expensive. Okay. There were too many internal barriers to have the client move forward. Basically, every cycle they had for improvement was completely stalled out because people were saying, no, it costs too much money or it takes too much time, which meant nothing got done. And eventually, you know, if you're moving along here, eventually the attackers are going to come up and take you out. That's exactly what happened. They took a risky gamble and they lost, largely because they failed to understand themselves. In an organization, you have multiple variables. A basic variable, horizontally here, is level within the organization. You know, you've got help desk down there when you can't see my little light. Um, and you know, C-level people over here. Another variable are the roles that people have. You know, whether they're admins, whether they're developers, whether they're accounting, stuff like that. There's also where silos come in, but that's a silo. The outside forces add another aspect to analyzing the business. You know, this is you know, change over. Uh, this is customers, investors, regulators, all with a different idea as to what is involved in the business. And then you've got other dimensions. You know, change over time, short-term versus long-term costs, stuff like that. Basically, businesses are inherently complex entities, and they're hard to analyze. And yet, management likes to have a single off-site meeting once a year and figure it all out. Okay. Any of you have been in any of those off-site meetings? Okay. A handful of people. Have they been useful? Did you get a lot of beer drunk? As a tip, if you're in one of these discussions about your organization and finding ways to improve it, and nobody's yelled yet, you haven't done deep enough. It's really easy to talk about surface level stuff, but if you want to get to deep improvement, you have to get to deep pain. And that's going to hurt, and people are going to yell. It's a mark, actually, of organizational maturity. You actually need to go through this because deep inspection requires honesty. Now, this can be helped with an external opinion. You know, consultants actually have expertise in dealing with this kind of thing. But so do peer groups, anybody that's part of a CAO roundtable or a CEO roundtable, that's what this is about. It's about peeling away the layers of bullshit and getting to the honest level. It's very hard to do. Now, if you're analyzing your organization, basically functioning as an internal consultant, you can follow the same process that external consultants go through. And this is identify what you need to learn, figure out how you can learn it, figure out how you can help others learn what they need to know. If you're functioning as a consultant, you have to think of yourself as doing an agile pair with the business. I'm going to guess this particular crowd knows about agile pair. Anybody not know about Agile Parent? Okay. In Agile development, one of the techniques you can do is pairing with another person. So it's two people sharing the same computer, coding at the same time. And if you take that approach, what tends to happen is people learn from one another and they make fewer mistakes as time goes by. And it seems really wasteful to have two people doing the same job when it could be one. But in most organizations, since the defect cost or the defect count is so much lower in those sorts of environments, it actually is a game. You know, it takes a while to figure out how to do it. You don't always do it all the time, but it's very useful. This is the same sort of thing that you can do in a consulting sort of world. You know, a good consultant is going to come in knowing pretty much nothing about the organization. That's why there's so many jokes about bad consultants out there. They pay them all this money, they learn nothing, right? They teach you nothing. But as a consultant learns, they learn and they teach. Okay? So if you're working with another business unit, you try to figure out what's going on, 
and you learn about that business unit, you're going to be asking questions that theoretically should make that business unit go, huh, I never thought about it that way. And you bring in ideas from the things that you've done that have worked elsewhere, and eventually, you know, you come up with a solution that works well all around. Basically, you identify learning cycles, you find ways to amplify these learning cycles, and make them more effective by taking out any loan blocks or pitfalls that might be there, and helping people learn faster and faster and faster, so they can execute faster. Consulting is not going to fix the short-term Lots of people like to hire consultants to make short-term pain go away. But that doesn't actually happen in the world because pain is caused by, you know, in the operations process. You have to shorten this, this pain over the long term and that can only happen by embracing the solutions internally and figure out where you need to go. As time goes by, the organization learns more quickly and you can begin the next round. Basically, 80% of security is up to you, unless you're a consultant, in which case 20% up to you. Who here has had contractors on staff? Anyone had them there for years? Okay. Anybody question the wisdom of having somebody responsible for security that knows everything about your organization that has loyalty to another person? Certain things need to be outsourced. You can outsource some things, but outsourcing tends to work best on short engagements because that helps the organization itself absorb the learning instead of trying to outsource the doing, which doesn't actually help for improvement. That keeps you level. That doesn't help you grow. Okay. So, don't need to talk about that. All right. This is the last point. You've got systems. Conflicts between systems cause pain. Almost every type of organizational pain you experience can be traced to conflicts between systems. We're going to talk about three types of systems. There are all sorts of subsystems here, but basically we're going to talk about people versus people, technology versus technology, and technology versus people. The people versus people system, yes, that, that dreaded diagram is superior. You have different paradigms. This results in risk misestimation. Suppose you have a world in which management is embracing risk because if they embrace risk and they're right, they make money. And IT, who is avoiding risk because every time management embraces risk, IT experiences pain. Once you get past the spiking that we talked about in previous slides, and you've got people focusing in the middle, you would think, okay, we're just going to look right here in the middle and find something good, right? In actuality, you're going to focus here <coughs> because management is going to win every fight you have. Management has power. IT has to care. Okay? The important thing is when you cave, don't cave into here. Make sure whatever solution you cave to <coughs> is an acceptable solution in your world. This is the bank story, I promise. Okay. I was working for a bank as a consultant a few years back. And uh, having a really hard time having them implement controls. Pretty much any controls. Okay. It started feeling a little bit weird because everything I talked to them about, they said, no, we can't do that. <coughs> no, we can't do that. And it wasn't, we don't have the money. Well, we don't have a t the time, it's just, no, we can't do that. So eventually I asked, if the president of the bank took a duffel bag into the bank vault, started filling it with money, and wanted to walk out the door, would you stop them? You know what their answer was? Of course not, it's his money. <laughs> I decided I couldn't really help that organization, and I, I left. But <laughs> it was J.B. Morgan, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a small community bank somewhere. Um, 
this is what happens when ITK is inappropriate. You have to understand the line where you know, this is an acceptable thing to give up and this is not. And if you don't know that, you're not a professional. You're just taking a paycheck until you get fired. Another system is tech versus tech. Okay. In this, the problem with two different technology systems is just like with two different groups of people. Communicating is hard. Okay. It's very hard to connect these systems. There's very little overlap. And the solution is usually to add a third technology to translate. It expands the available set of space that you can use to pipe things back and forth, and you can have the two systems work together more cleanly. This actually is what sims are supposed to do, but generally speaking, you know, we haven't evolved on the learning side to make that work very well. Personally, I'm biased towards using open source technology in this space. Okay. It's very easy to implement, it's very cheap, you can get it in, but the learning tends to be lower. Okay. You get great learning out of it, you get great cost savings, but it comes at the cost of time. So if you have two systems you need to connect together, consider you know, technologies. Perl is good, Python is good, Ruby is good. If you're stuck in a Windows world, PowerShell is okay. Uh, right. I'm a little bit biased, I'll say that. I actually don't know that much about PowerShell. I just really like the other languages. So, anybody here a PowerShell expert? I'm looking for somebody that's an expert in both PowerShell and Python or Ruby so they can tell me how to compare. Everybody I know that does Python or Ruby has a bottle of PowerShell. So I kind of do that as an indicator. All right. Finally, you have technology versus people. Technology is good at some things and people are good at some things. Technology is good at doing the same thing the same way every time and processing vast amounts of data quickly. People are good at you know, finding better ways to do things and reacting to situations if you let them do that. The bigger an organization gets, the less people are allowed to be people and the more technology is expected to be people. It's bizarre. Because what people and technology are bad at are their respective strengths. Basically, we're back to this. We've got cycles for people to learn from, and cycles for technology will learn from. Now, people in technology do interact, but that's a different cycle. Okay? When we use this cycle, we say that we're improving technology, but we're not. We're using technology to improve our own internal learning. Okay? Remember, we need both individuals and iterations. If technology doesn't support people, it's not going to be used. Waste delays the learning cycle, so you get beat by better teams, whether it's your attackers or your competition. So if you're going to automate, automate intelligently. Learn first, understand your systems, then automate them. If you try to automate too quickly in the process, which is far too common, you wind up with a system that sends out alerts that nobody knows how to respond. So, in conclusion, attackers can attack in any direction using whatever works. You're limited by your budget, by laws, by ethics, by your resources. The advantage is on the side of the attacker. Now, I recommend you start with an assessment, whether it's external or internal, it doesn't matter. The important thing is learning what you don't know. If you're really smart, it's about getting past that hurdle where learning is painful. If you're a hard worker, it's about learning what you need to do to work better. This helps you identify the overly large security gaps and narrow them with technology. Identify learning cycles and accelerate them with people. And identify pitfalls in the learning process, things that are preventing you from executing and fix those in the process. This is the kind of review I do, just so you get an example, basic, 
organizational stuff, and network review, web review, malware, basic, you know, threat vector mapping. Kind of look at the business, look at what you're responsible for from different threat vectors, figure out where you're going to go, and basically you know, wind up with a document you can look at and help guide the next phase of work. Basically, you need the right people doing the right things with the right tools. Otherwise, you're going to fail. So, that's it.